fire is rapidly spreading right now. The embers were falling in. We were fighting off the guard house on both sides. We, it looks like we held it off just in time for the, for the firefighters to come. Look how close the fire is. It's literally right there. It was terrifying. Again, hundreds of thousands of people forced out of their homes, millions left without power, and multiple properties were lost in California this week. And as the world gets warmer and drier, the fires just get more intense. All of this while more and more people move into vulnerable areas. It's so bad, even one of the state's electrical companies couldn't handle it. It shut off power to avoid sparks. At one point, 800,000 people had their lights, their air conditioning, their heat, everything turned off. So scientists say what's happening in California is just a microcosm of what's going to happen around the world as climate change gets worse. And earlier this week, as the fires raged, Anderson Cooper spoke to the L.A. mayor about what he calls the new normal for his city. When you have high dry days, a lot of fuel because we had these intense rains in January because of these extreme weather uh, swings that we're seeing everywhere due to mm. climate change. Those things combine with the wind and suddenly we have something you cannot control. And I always say if you don't believe climate change is happening, talk to a firefighter. Yeah. Huh. If there is a solution to this, it will take two things, money and innovation. But this is California, home of Silicon Valley, and some of the richest and smartest people in the world live there. So what are they doing to turn things around? Well, with a few exceptions, not that much. They're not big investors in technology to fight climate change or natural disasters. And those rolling blackouts that I mentioned? Well, take a look at who wasn't affected. Check this out. Here is Silicon Valley. The blackouts are in red. And the big tech headquarters, well, according to Wired magazine, all of their lights stayed on while the homes around them had no power. And if you take a closer look, yeah, just, just outside that line, right there, that's Tesla, owned by tech billionaire Elon Musk. It just made the cut. The tech companies, they can pay for better infrastructure and better protection. And so can the ultra-wealthy. Remember when Kim Kardashian told Ellen she hired her own firefighters? We were fortunate enough and blessed enough, and I know that not everyone has this luxury available to them, but we were able to get private firefighters, a company that you can hire. Because of them, they saved our home and saved our neighborhood. But, and and Kim's not alone anymore. Private firefighting firms are springing up all over California. According to the New York Times, it only costs $3,000 a day. So everybody else? Well, let's just say that a lot of people complain that a state of emergency wasn't declared this year until celebrities like LeBron James were threatened. He tweeted, these L.A. fires aren't no joke. So now that everyone, even the ultra-rich, can see flames jumping over highways and racing towards them, is California at a turning point? Will Silicon Valley step in to help save their own backyard? Tesla's Elon Musk, he's a rarity. He's been building those electric cars to try and cut carbon. But he also has an escape plan to build colonies on Mars. Here he is telling Stephen Colbert that he personally wants to move there someday. Eventually, you can transform Mars into an Earth-like planet. How would you do that? Uh, you'd, you'd warm it up. Just warm it up. If you with warm, a blanket it, or with what? <laughs> how would you, how well, would you this, warm Mars up? You know, this, it's, it's this a the long fast way, way away from the sun. It's the fast way uh, and the slow way. Okay. Uh, give, me, <laughs> give, me the, give me the fast way. The fast way is, is drop thermonuclear weapons over the poles. <laughs> yep. Not a joke. He has been testing, sending real rockets, and has an actual 25-year plan to try to make those colonies on Mars happen. Joining me now is David Wallace-Wells, the author of the New York Times best-selling book, Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. He's in New York. Uh, so, David, you've said that you're kind of puzzled that the plutocrats of Silicon Valley aren't doing more, that they've got all this money, they've got huge brains, but that they're not doing more to fight climate change. Why are you so puzzled? Well, these are people, you know, the, the leaders of these big companies, the founders of these big companies, they're people who like to see themselves as world historical figures. They see themselves kind of operating entirely outside the realm of even the normal economy. You would think that people like that 
would respond to a crisis like this by trying to deploy their power, if only to gratify their own egos and make themselves feel more powerful and more of use. But in fact, um, while they pay lip service here and there to the climate crisis, and some of them in their philanthropic work do donate some of their money to, um, to climate-related causes, generally speaking, their orientation in their business practice has been to turn entirely away from the crisis, not to try to um, use their capital, use their, um, their institutions and their organizations to address this problem, but to continue making tools of distraction, um, which is what they've been doing for a generation or two. So do you actually think that they could solve the problem? I do think that in addition to really significant public sector um, action here, which I think is the most important thing, um, that the power and innovation of um, private individuals can make a difference when they are as wealthy as people like you know Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos are. Um, these are people in their organizations that are effectively operating as nation states themselves. Um, they are that powerful, that wealthy. Um, they command that much intellectual talent. And all of that is or could be very useful in the fight against climate change. Do you see that changing now? That you know, Now we're seeing like flames jump across the highway. Even the, the celebrities, uh, Silicon Valley, they must be seeing the same pictures that the rest of us are. Is this a turning point? Those images are so striking, so gripping. Um, and I think that that awakening is happening in Silicon Valley as it is in Hollywood, as it is all around the world. But I think there are also some particular obstacles to, real, to a real focus on climate change in the tech community having to do with the fact that many of these people are temperamentally and by training engineers. They tend not to think of problems that they can solve that require something other than a coding solution to be anything worth addressing, which is one reason why I think um, they've been so reluctant to deal with some of the political problems that have surfaced over the last few years on their social media platforms. But I think it also has a lot to do with the structure of venture capital, which has really organized the entire entrepreneurial activity of Silicon Valley now for several decades. And that's to say, these are investments made very early on in very small companies that are dependent or predicated on the idea that those companies could grow incredibly rapidly with almost no marginal cost at all. We're going to need new kinds of planes. We're going to need a new electric grid. We're going to need um, wind turbines and solar arrays. These are much more expensive capital investments, which venture capital doesn't really have a way of funding. And as a result, Silicon Valley as a whole, I think, has turned away from that kind of engineering and focused instead on the much more profitable uh, method that they've developed over the last few decades of turning out apps and programs, which can work seamlessly and costlessly um, and represent, therefore, a much more immediate um, profit-seeking opportunity. Your book is called The Uninhabitable Earth. Uh, Elon Musk was telling Stephen Colbert the other day that he's going to make Mars habitable. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm in, the in theory, I'm all for space exploration, but this is a really basic and problematic um, mistake that, uh, that Elon has made, and a lot of people in Silicon Valley have sort of um, fallen in line with him on, you know, no matter how bad the planet's or the Earth's climate gets, no matter how bad it gets, it will be so much easier to engineer a livable system here than it would be for us to do that on Mars, which is so different from anything that humans have ever lived on before. So, you know, there may be some scientific wisdom in making more visits to Mars. I don't want to argue with that proposition, but the idea that we would be doing that as a solution to climate change is completely preposterous. It would be much, much more efficient to spend those resources stabilizing and securing the planet's climate um, the, the, the climate of the planet that we live on, rather than trying to figure out how to make a world that is totally unlivable and has never been livable, um, livable for all the billions of us who are going to need a place to move as soon as 2050 or 2075, if things really get out of hand. Even recently, the, the special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights at the United Nations was saying we risk a climate apartheid scenario where the wealthy pay to escape overheating, hunger, and conflict while the rest of the world is left to suffer. In California, for example, we saw rich people were evacuated. Most people were, were able to get out of the way. And yet you had, we were hearing reports of workers showing up, not getting the message. They're in danger. There's such stark divisions now. I mean, will what's happening in California make any difference? 
Well, I think the, the images alone are quite alarming, and in particular, the footage from last year's Paradise, um, fire, the campfire in Paradise, I think was really, really harrowing to people, no matter where they saw it, no matter who they were all around the world. I've heard from people who were absolutely gripped and horrified by those images and terrified that wildfires like them might come for them. I think fires are a really powerful teaching tool in a grotesque way because of that. Um, but you're right, the, the inequities are visible everywhere there are climate impacts. It's, you know, California may be um, quite, maybe most dramatic, not just the differentials that you're talking about, but, you know, there are people hiring private firefighting forces to help them protect their homes. Um, those people who are dependent on the, the public firefighters, the, the Cal Fire Forces, the, um, those firefighters, many of them are um, it, imprisoned inmates who have been um, let out in order to fight those fires and who are working for as little as a dollar a day what they'll, when they finish fighting those fires, they'll return to jail. And when they're released from jail, they will be barred because they are felons from seeking employment as firefighters on their own outside, even if they had spent much of their time in prison fighting fires on behalf of California. I saw a study that just came out today about the impact of air pollution just in India. This study said that by the year 2100, if we don't change course, just through air pollution, one and a half million Indians would be dying every single year because of air pollution. And These yet, impacts are going to be visited on the global south much more intensely than on the global north. But I also think that as much as we have to keep in mind these differentials, we also need to understand that we are also all in this together. Um, the impacts are both um, divergent and, and showcase incredible inequalities, but they also remind us that we have a shared faith. We, have, we are a shared humanity, we have one planet, and if we have a hope of living on it together, we have to take action soon. David, it's all so interesting. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. Thanks for having me.